Welcome back to the lunch break. It is Tuesday of Passion Week in the life of Jesus, and well, we're only three days away from killing the Jewish carpenter who claimed that he was the son of God, who we really believe he was just a poet and or a politician and or, well, a prophet or the son of the devil himself. We really can't make up our mind as humans who he is, so let's just jump right into Tuesday and try to determine who is this guy that claims to be the king of the Jews and why is Tuesday so significant? Because I thought Sunday, the resurrection day, was the most significant day and well, maybe it is. But to get to Sunday, the resurrection, to be more meaningful to us as a human, it helps to understand the week leading up, which is a week of misery for Jesus, but he is going to teach us how to handle misery, backtrack to Monday Passion Week. Let's jump right into Tuesday, though, because this is really interesting. Mark chapter 11, verse 20 begins Tuesday because it says, and the next day, so therefore it's Tuesday. And we jump right in with this thought, and this may help you understand Tuesday. The guy doing all the talking in Tuesday is Jesus. He's confronted by religious people, and all kind of crazy things begin going on. He bumps into a widow, uses her as an object lesson, and he talks about taxes and marriage and divorce and authority and the end, <laughs> the future. He looks at all of this in Tuesday, but to understand the greatest part of this whole day, you just got to know the character of the guy who's, well, doing all the talking, and that's Jesus, and here's what's really weird. He already knows the future. Hmm. Well, he at least knows the day of his death and how he will die. So when he's talking, it's not like he's figuring it out. Like, I don't know if I'm going to die on Friday because that's really weird that you could know the day you were going to die and how you were going to die. And it really makes for an interesting subject on Tuesday as we look at what he says for us to understand. So let's jump right in. It's Tuesday morning. The guys are kind of, well, I call them the guys, the disciples, the followers of Jesus who will tuck, tell, and run. So we really wonder if they're followers at all. <laughs> but we'll deal with that later. They're kind of confused that Jesus has cursed the fig tree. They're blown away, actually. They can't believe that what he did on Monday to curse the fig tree is now cursed and there's no fruit and they're blown away. And they say, oh man, the fig tree you cursed has no fruit. We're blown away. Jesus says, don't be blown away. Have faith in God. For if you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in your heart that those things which you say shall come to pass, you shall have whatever you say. <laughs> That's the word of faith doctrine. Jesus was already preparing us for that moment. Mm. Well, I don't know about that. I'll leave that alone and let you determine it. But from Jesus' perspective, he says, have faith in God, boys. In other words, there's another level of living here. And we kind of take it to mean have faith in God, the God of heaven, which is true. I'm not opposed to that. But when he says have faith in God, meaning you're blown away that what I said came to pass, don't be blown away, boys, because I am God. And whatever I say will come to pass. So maybe in a weird way, Jesus is not just telling us to trust the God of heaven, but to trust the God who was also the Son on the earth, that whatever he says will come to pass, even when it doesn't look like it's going to come to pass. Because if he says it on Monday, you can just guarantee it's going to come to pass. It may be Tuesday or it may be 2,000 years later. But it really doesn't matter. If he says he's coming back, he's coming back. He may not come back tomorrow, but he is coming back because the whole point point of Tuesday is to lend into, I am the Son of God and whatever I say will happen because I have authority over everything. And so, well, that's how Tuesday begins with a little mind-blowing object lesson that Jesus, who cursed the fig tree, which here's something weird in and of itself that's kind of mind-blowing, is that the very fig tree curse represented the Jewish nation, but he himself is also the king of the Jews. So in a weird way, he's kind of prophetically saying, boys, don't get blown away that I'm alive right now, but I'm going to be dead because I myself am going to become the curse. So the very fig tree that you see is really me taking the curse upon my Myself to deliver the Jewish nation so that they and all other humans on the planet can produce fruit. Okay, so that's the beginning of the morning, and they're kind of mind blown by that. But then we have to deal with more religious people. You have to love the Passion Week of Jesus because he just can't get rid of religious people. <laughs> they're just kind of like parasites. They show up all the time to complain and, well, try to elbow their way into all of their authority and their brilliance. And so Jesus picks up the second thought beyond having faith in God and that his word is always prophetically true. Even when you don't think it's true, it's still true. 
Now he deals with religious people. Who has the most authority? Do you have authority? Who should we pay taxes to? Tell me about dead people. When we die and we're married and divorced, who does a dead person get if she marries seven people? And then off we go into a whirlwind of people who just consistently have to try to, well, pick him apart to catch him in his own words. And Jesus ends that part in, well, chapter 12, verse 44, because he ends the whole debate with these religious people with a widow. And he says of the widow, hey, look at her. She just gave an offering. Do you see all these rich people? And I love this word because here's the second thought of Tuesday. All these religious people that are complaining and whining and doing their religious duties and trying to figure out who's the greatest and what commandment they, can they keep to, well, appease me. Look at the widow because all these rich people have given a contribution, but the widow gave everything. Everything she had to live on, she gave. Everybody else gave a contribution. So maybe on Tuesday, Jesus is showing us that this thinking that a relationship with him is just a contribution of your religiosity. And well, we're kind of there today. <laughs> we're sort of in that moment right now because we were so used to making a weekly religious contribution in the name of God. We call it church. We come, we give God our $5. It's my religious contribution. I may even serve in the nursery. <laughs> and give a religious contribution to God, but we really don't give him everything. Because what Jesus is going to show us is that to be, be his follower Tuesday, he's going to show us it requires everything. Boys, you've only made some contributions until now. You've passed out bread for me. You've followed me. You've, you've rowed my boat for me. You've prepared all the things that I've needed prepared. And you guys have really been here to help my ministry. You've contributed well but now we're done with the season of contribution and we're going into the season of he who follows me must pick up his own cross, die to himself, and well live for me. So the second thing we understand in Tuesday is we're going to have to die to follow Jesus. This whole thing of, well, it's just my faith is my religious contribution. I give an offering, maybe a tithe if I feel spiritual, and I go once a month to this thing called church. And well, therefore, and thus, because I've contributed to the religiosity of the very generation within which I live in, and I'm trying to be a better person by keeping all the commandments and the rules of religion to impress other people, therefore, I must be spiritual. Not according to Jesus. Jesus says, you must give everything. And truly, we're going to see shortly in the days ahead that, well, all of the disciples that follow him had not given everything. They were only contributors. And if you really want to know where your faith is, just let all hell begin to break loose because those who contribute run and those who contribute panic and fall apart. But those who are genuine followers realize I must die to me and myself and my needs and my agenda. And therefore, I must follow Jesus. And the third thing in day to Tuesday that we pick up from Jesus is this. He goes into this long discourse. Theologically, it's called the Olivet Discourse. You're welcome. I got that off Wikipedia, just so you don't think I'm too smart. No, it is the Olivet Discourse. It's Mark chapter 13, pretty much the whole chapter. Jesus begins to go into this weird prophetic thing about the future. You will see signs and wonders. The moon will turn to blood. There will be wars and famines and earthquakes and diseases and things are going to get really bad, so bad that if I, God, doesn't step in, well, we will lose all humanity. Whew, that's mind-blowing in and of itself. But Jesus goes into the future. Why? Because he is the future as well as the past and the present. He is all. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So therefore, if he's also the end and the beginning, he's also the present moment and the future moment. And therefore, on Tuesday, he pretty much lends to us, boys, here, here's the lesson. I have told you, and whatever I say happens, have faith in me. Number two, it's going to require everything of you, so don't think you can just get away following me by giving me cheap contributions because there's coming a future where it's going to get so bad, but don't worry, I'm coming back. You can trust me because just like I said to the fig tree and it happened, what I'm about to tell you now is of a future thing that's going to happen, so trust me. And well, in talking about the future, he lends into verse 30 of chapter 13, this generation will not pass away. Whew, man, we have debated this one. The generation that sees all of these signs and wonders and earthquakes and famines and wars and all of the blood moons. Mm, love that. I'll hold that for another day for you. 
this generation will not pass away. And the weird thing is, since that moment, we've been trying to determine who is that generation. Well, if you're, you know, a preterist and it's all over, that generation is the boys right at hand. In other words, he's talking straight to them. But no, if you believe in the rapture and you're a premillennialist, <laughs> he's not talking to the boys, he's talking to us, to, to the future. That's weird. But what if... We've all been trying to figure out what generation from 1948 to 1968 to all the Jewish signs, the things going on in Israel, maybe this is the moment. This is when the fig tree buds. It's probably us. We're coming. He's coming back now. He said he would. Well, here's the deal. What if it was not even meant to be the generation like we know it as in a 40-year generation or a 72-year generation or the generation since 1968 when the Jews and Israel and all the signs of the time and the fig tree budded. What if Jesus was not even thinking that way? That's the way we've been thinking so we could write more prophetic books about the end time to get more people to buy into the life of Jesus. Well, what if Jesus says this generation will not pass away, meaning the generation of people who believe in him and who die to everything to follow him? Well, that kind of goes to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. For you who believe in me, who follow me, and who die for me are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that those who follow and those who watch may see the goodness of God. In other words, when Jesus says, this generation shall not pass away, well, perhaps he was thinking that your life as a follower of Jesus who died to your own agendas, your own selfishness, your own self, who gave him everything, who picked up your cross to follow him, who had faith in him, would understand that you are the generation of believers. In other words, the generation who believes in me, who follows me, who gives me everything, who has faith in me, they will not pass away because they are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Maybe that's what Jesus said. Maybe it's time to, well, end Tuesday like he did and think of it myself. Am I really sold out? Am I really watching? And am I really alert to his coming? I hope that helped you a little bit. It's just Tuesday. Wednesday gets really good. Hey, have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.